Are we expecting anybody else? No. Okay, fine. So, um, sorry for the delay. For those of you who haven't met, I've met everybody but this young lady. You take your time over it. Everybody just look at her and make her feel really uncomfortable. No uh, So my name is Ayo. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about ergonomics and how ergonomics have an impact in, in our medical therapy. So we know what ergonomics is. The science of like designing things that are easy to use. Or yeah, yeah, cool. Well done. So, ergonomics is, uh, I, I like definitions because it lets us know where we are uh, in terms of, so, and we will make sure that we know that we're understanding each other. So, ergonomics is relating to or um, designed for efficiency and comfort in the working environment. So, can you think of any sort of implications from a, a medical point of view? So again, this is going to go really much quicker <laughs> as we, uh, this is going to be supposed to be interesting. You know how to put your hand on the box, it's not for a time. <laughs> uh, the chairs and computers. We chairs use. and computers, we use. that's a prime example, fantastic. Okay, so um, we're going to do um, a quick um, question, just quick drop all in a room. Who is left-handed? One, two. How many people are there in there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So two people who are left handed, that's one eighth, right? I wasn't sure I was going to get that, so I'm very proud of myself. Right. Okay, so um, it's, it's probably representative of the population being left handed and the most left handed people in the room. So if we were to take a step, up, a step back and look at it, that means that the majority of people are right-handed. We can accept that as a statement of fact, right? But that also means that the number of people, the majority of people who design things are also going to be right-handed. Do you think that follows? Uh, and as a consequence, so in every sphere of life, the majority of people who occupy those positions are also right-handed, which means that their view of life is a right-handed view of life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Fine. So, can you see an issue there? What's, what? It's the issue? same as city planners, yeah. So city planners are often men or town planners. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's it called? Pavement, you go under a grid, sort of like a safety grate, and then yeah. actually you can't get a push chair or a yeah. chair through because the person designing the service, the product, yeah. doesn't have another perspective other than their own. Fantastic. So not only is the designer limited by their point of view, but the person who is the commissioner is limited by their point of view. The person who's in charge of the budget is limited by their point of view. Simply as a consequence of the fact that they're different from the other person. And, and of course, historically, there might even have been an argument from an economic point of view. So um, if we produce all these things for right-handed people, Yes, let's just say, I don't know, a thing, <laughs> and um, it costs, because of the fact that there's so many right-handed people, we can produce 10,000. It costs us 5p per unit. As a consequence of an economies of scale argument, producing this 10 things for left-handed people might cost 10 pounds. So there might have even been a historical argument for, um, actually, it's not worth economically us considering left-handed people. But then, either because of left-handed people say, you know, we are people too, um, or compassionate right-handed people, we have now things like left-handed uh, scissors. Left-handed scissors, that's what my wife used. Uh, or left-handed guitar, you know? Um, so I'm going to stick with the guitar analogy because I'm a guitar player. Um, so, imagine... So, so you can see, let's say we didn't have left-handed guitars, but the aim in life is to play guitar. Can you see how the person who is left-handed has to work differently, we can talk about later whether it's harder or not, differently to achieve potentially the same result as somebody who is right-handed? Can we, 
Do you follow? Mm -hmm. yeah. You look confused. With the guitar though, I feel like it's that way, isn't it? So wouldn't it be harder for a right hand person to learn so, notes with the left? No, no, so, um, so what I'm talking about is in the context of um, the fact that the majority of people are right-handed, the task is playing the guitar. As a consequence of the majority of people being right-handed, the guitar is a right-handed guitar. So I play the guitar, so I play like this. Yeah. So for a left-handed person to play, it's kind of the opposite of how their brain works. So not only do they have to learn music and all that kind of stuff, they also have to learn from the ergonomics how to hold their body and use their hands because they're using the opposite limb than they might want to use for that. Okay. So that again, the task is playing the guitar, but to get to the point of playing it well, it's, do you think it's harder? I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's at the very least different, yeah? Okay, we're gonna do a quick straw poll. Another thing, I want you to put your hand up. Everybody in here is uh, a medical dilemma. So for all the doctors in the room, I want you to put your hand up if when you declared yourself as saying I wanted to be a doctor, you had any negative feedback from anybody in any sort of educational establishment. So which are answering the question? No. Hands up if you had or if you have had any negative feedback. I want you to put your hands up if whilst at work in your working uniform, whether the scrubs or whatever, the set has got around your neck, you've ever been mistaken for somebody who is non-clinical? Like people with dementia. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I would like you to put your hand up if you've ever been in the hospital and the patient has refused to allow you to treat them. Um, put your hand up if it's happened more than once. And put your hands down if you work in any. Because <laughs> 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 that's an A-E <laughs> okay. So uh, I want you to put your hands up if pre-COVID a patient has declined to shake your hand. Uh, and I want you to, so again this is a non-clinical example. I want you to put your hand up if you ever walk past the car and the central lock is gone off. Uh, and my last example, I want you to put your hand up if you've been in a restaurant and you've been asked to pay for your meal, get restaurant not takeaway prior to you finishing your meal. Prior to you finishing your meal in a restaurant not takeaway. Right, so you might be thinking, what's this got to do with the uh, And you'd be right, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> I set you up for a fail. Um, so, um, I, um, it was in, no, so I, I had a stroke in June, for those of you who don't know. Um, prior to that is when um, George Floyd was killed in America. And when I came back to work, I had a conversation with Karen because I was like, I, I want to talk about this, you know, um, because we're all human beings and we're all have different experiences. Um, so Karen booked this one, booked this teaching for me to do, and I've been thinking, like, what do I want to say? Um, the reason I didn't say what I was going to talk about from the very beginning is that in my experience, having been me for as long as I have, um, whenever you have these kinds of conversations and when you talk about race or its impact in society and, and work, it's a, it's a very charged um, conversation. And it's, it's, it's easy, I think, for people to put their backs up and go, you know, I don't want to talk about it or I'm not going to go into this interaction with the mindset to learn anything new or to discover anything. So I, I wanted to intentionally fool you, so I, I, I apologize. Sorry, not sorry. Well done. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I got you, all right? I got you, I got you. I got you. okay. So, yeah, I was thinking, like, what do I want to talk about? What do I want to talk about? So there was a lot of analysis paralysis, you know, because to be fair, there is a lot of information out there. There is a lot of information out there. So I thought, I am going to talk about my experiences 
um, as a black man. I'm, I'm black by race, in case, in case you guys hadn't realized. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about my experiences of being a black doctor. So uh, I, I'll talk about why I've gone this route later. Uh, so I am 40 this year. Um, let me give you some examples of the things that happened to me again. This isn't from a point of view that I want you to feel sorry for me. This is a statement of fact of things that have happened in my life. I'm sure everybody has stories. I'm sure people in this room also have stories about things that happened to them. Uh, and again, we're colleagues and friends, some of you. Um, <laughs> uh, so there is also an opportunity if you also want to share your experiences about what you guys have dealt with. So, um, I can remember we used to live in Man I live in Manchester. I used to live with my parents in. Um, uh, we had a caravan, and for some reason the washing line went over the caravan, and I had to fix it. This is my very memorable situation. I was on the roof of the caravan, and I remember um, feeling a little unsteady, so I looked around, and I was just about to jump off, and I did, and there was a police officer that was just happened to be in the area running around. What you up there, mate? I'm fixing the washing line. Uh, where do you live? Here. Uh, how, can you prove that? I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, I was thinking, but I'm not sure how I prove that. <laughs> but um, I thought that the question was a little silly. Um, so I went to the front door. Um, my brother was like, do you know this guy? Yes, he's my brother. Where does he live? Here. And then that was the end of it. But again, it, it was very strange, um, that interaction. Um, my brothers moved to London, and I can remember being in London with my younger brother in his BMW. Uh, nice car, actually. Um, <laughs> and um, we were coming around the corner, and we were waved over by a police officer. And the police officer said, oh, um, We've got a van around the corner, and your car doesn't have any insurance. So my brother was like, um, okay, fine. Uh, so he pulled over, and can I see your driving license? He says to my brother. My brother showed him the driving license, and he was like, well, you're not wearing glasses, uh, sorry, you're wearing glasses in, these, in this picture. And my brother was like, well, wearing contact lenses, to which point the police officer decided that it was his, in everybody's best interest for him to look into his eyes, <laughs> just, wow. to, just to confirm that he was wearing contact lenses. And then another police officer asked me, uh, where's your driving license? Which seems like a silly question, because I'm not driving. <laughs> um, and then just matter of factly, like it was the next obvious question to ask. So what's your immigration status in the UK? Uh, literally, next question. And just in case I didn't have the right answer, there was an immigration officer right next to me. And again, I'm sure it was a random stop, um, but looking around everybody in the pavement, there wasn't anybody who wasn't dark skinned. Um, so you, it makes you wonder what's the premise of this um, stop. Uh, there was other examples. So I went to a Chinese restaurant. Um, because a friend of mine was leaving Manchester, uh, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, and um, we went to a restaurant and it was a buffet. So, the buffet you pay for the seats, you don't pay for the meal, interesting, I didn't know that, um, till this experience. And um, we went to sit down and I realised that I'd left my phone in full view in my car. I was like, I need to go back and get my phone. So, um, the gentleman stood in front of me and I was like, I just need to go. He was like, oh, toilets are over there. I thought it was a bit of a strange thing to say, but I was like, that's nice. Um, <laughs> and I carried on where I was going. And I came back, and again, there was probably about 15 of us um, around the table, all of them looked like me. And we were having a good time, because um, we're all friends. And then, can you, can you guys pay for your bill? Well, we're still, we're still eating. Um, yeah, you need to pay now. I don't understand why, why do we have to pay now? Because, because you've been here for too long. Okay, but you said it's two and a half hours. You 
no waiting time. We've only been here for an hour and a half. Yeah, but you know, you're making too much noise. Right. But with respect, there's people that have been over here. Not that we pay attention, but they're as loud, if not louder than us. Yeah, but it's confusing. <laughs> what, what's, what's confusing? And then it was, it was basically like, um, which one of these issues <laughs> is the reason why you would like us to leave? So we were like, we're not going to pay. Okay, well, I'm going to stand here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Would you like some cake? <laughs> um, I mean, there's more, to, there's more to that story. Um, but yeah, so I'm trying to think what else happened. Um, I now live in Middleton. I used to live in Fieldsworth. I was coming home one time. My wife told me we used to live across from a park. There's a kids across the park um, throwing mud at our door. Right, okay, so I'm like, well, don't get involved. You stay inside, I'll, just, I'll sort it out when I get back. I got home to realize it wasn't mud. Right. Um, so, um, th there was a, I'm sure there was a bin in the park, and they've got, you know, when people walk the dogs and they've got bags with um, dog mess, and they had thrown that at our door. And there's another family of black people, a couple of those down, and ours were the only two doors that things have been thrown out, so I can guess at their motivation, I'm not sure. Um, I'm trying to think what else have happened to me as a person being black. Well, so again, what I used to work in houses for Fraser in Manchester, uh, Kendall's. And uh, so I am used to, having been black for 40 years, be going to shops and being in a situation where me and the security guard are going to be very good friends because he's going to, or she is going to pay close attention to what I'm doing. That's just, just I'm, I'm used to that. There isn't, it's not a good or a bad thing, but I'll let you make be the judge of that, I'm just used to that. So I've been in Kendall's, but I can remember, so obviously when I'm working in Kendall's, I'm wearing a shirt and a tie and smart trousers, but I can remember going to Kendall's on a number of occasions in my own clothes, and being watched by people I worked with because I must look. I must look great, great, great <laughs> different in a um, without a shirt and tie or whatever. So these are the experiences um, that I've grown up with um, that have informed my view of the world. Um, and again, I get, I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I'm just telling you this is the stuff I'm, I have dealt with and deal with every day. Uh, it's a choice to decide how I deal with it and how I project that in terms of um, my interactions with people who look like me and people who don't look like me. Um, okay. Um, right, my experience as a black doctor. Uh, so when I decided, I mean, I've always wanted to be a doctor. I didn't realize how long I wanted to be a doctor for. I've been wanting to be a doctor since I was in primary school. I, I went to, I, I, when we arrived in the UK, because I was born in Nigeria, um, I, is that maybe a relevant question? I remember it. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, we used to live in Hume, which is right next to my side, and um, I went to school in the area. When I went in high school, I said to my science teacher that I wanted to be a doctor, and she laughed at me. That was her first response. Uh, there wasn't any, oh no, you, oh well, good for you. That was her, I mean, I, Mary, I, me and her didn't get on. <laughs> to Mary, that's not something to think about as well. But uh, you do wonder, and again, I'm not judging is what it is, but I'm a child and she's an adult, but whatever. Um, and I, so I'm, I am always, in, in awe of people who got into medical first medical school first time because I did not. I applied three times and got in on the third time. I only ever had one interview. The only one. Um, and, um, so I'm very grateful for the position that I'm in today. But it took me a long time to get here and it was very hard. Um, so getting into medical school um, in Manchester Medical School I think my year was about five hundred people and there were only 15 black people there. 
And I remember at the time thinking, is there something, I didn't think much about it, but is there something wrong with the selection process? Because are you telling me that these are the only eligible people who apply? It, it was just a question I asked the air and left it. Um, twice in my career, I have been mistaken for a taxi driver whilst wearing a shirt, whilst having a stethoscope for a minute. Um, I've had um, so stories of a friend of mine, we were talking, his consultant, he's an Asian gentleman, an older Asian gentleman. So imagine walking down a corridor, you've got an older Asian gentleman wearing a tie and stethoscope and a younger black doctor with glasses. They've both got stethoscopes in their hand. One is obviously older, one is obviously junior. One has a pad um, and a lady comes to the older Asian gentleman and says, oh, please put this one. Um, give this to uh, bed, whatever it is like. So hold on, I'm sorry, I thought you were the cleaner or something. Um, I don't know, again this isn't I'm not this isn't a comment about cleaners, but this gentleman wasn't dressed in any way that would make you well you, you would hope. Oh, I wonder how many cleaners wear shirt and tie. <laughs> I don't know. Let's just roll call. But you, you know it, it makes you wonder as to perceptions. Um, I had a gentleman, so again, pre-COVID, I always like to shake people's hands because I think it helps you create rapport when you're introducing yourself to people. I had a gentleman say to me, um, oh, no, um, he wouldn't shake my hand, oh, it's not because you're black, mate. But prior to you saying that, I didn't think that was <laughs> the issue at all. But now you've introduced that to the conversation. Again, it is what it is. No point getting excited about it. I still, I still got to treat you. Um, yes, I mean, I think with respect to my colleagues who look like me and are also dark skinned, I think I've had it pretty easy. I haven't had anybody call me any sort of names whilst I've been in hospital. I haven't had anybody be violent to me. I actually haven't had anybody, uh, not that many people, refuse to be seen by me. Um, but as a consequence of my experience as a man, one of the things that I might wonder when there is a negative interaction with a patient or a staff member, you have to wonder, is it because of that? In a way that I wonder whether people who don't look like me have to consider. Does that make sense? Um, so, are you, are you following me so far? Are we doing okay? Fine, so we're going to talk about some things. Again, I do like definitions. We're going to talk about bias. Well, we're going to um, just define it. So bias is an inclination of prejudice for or against one person or group, especially in a way considered to be unfair. Um, prejudice, so we all have bias. Let's just get that out of the way before there's any. I mean, this, this is my opinion. I'll in, invite you to ask the questions and to make some comments later, but this is my opinion. I believe that the, the evidence is strong enough for nobody to be able to deny that they have bias. We all have bias. Some of them are conscious, some of them are unconscious. Prejudice, which for me, I think is the consequence of bias, um, is unjustified or incorrect attitude, usually negative, towards somebody or some people. Uh, discrimination is when you form systems as a consequence of that bias, and, and then, um, so somebody's up and somebody's down. So, I'll, we'll talk about how it um, Im impacts and privilege, which is a contentious topic, topic these days, is a slight, is a special right advantage or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. So let's go back to our example about handedness. This is how I explain racism to my children. I use this example. Um, bias. I think left-handed people are lazy. That's an opinion of a right-handed person about left-handed people. Yeah? Prejudice. As a consequence of the fact that I think um, left-handed people are lazy, I'm not going to employ right-handed people when there are, sorry, left-handed people, excuse me, when there are right-handed people there. Now again, um, speaking to some of, some of my friends, 
we've had some, so there's, there's, there's often experiences of work for a job. I know that I am equivalent to the people who also apply for the job. I didn't get the job, or it's just me and somebody else. And again, you, you do wonder, is it because of that? And this is in a situation where no one's saying anything, but I, I, I'm aware of people and have had experiences where they're told explicitly, this is why you've not been hired. Or um, a, a family friend of mine is a doctor and her father was a pioneer in interventional radiology and he was told, if there is somebody who is white, applying for the same job as you, you will not get this job. I think that's more of a historical comment because you'd probably be sued off the face of the earth if you said that today. But um, these things and these attitudes don't just go away because the legislation is um, a bit more stringent. Discrimination, specifically in the hand of this example. I am going to advertise, for example, in a place where only right handed people go, or make it uh, more accessible to right handed people. So as to, again, system, so as to um, disenfranchise left handed people. I'm privileged. So let's go back to our example about guitar playing, right? So the thing about privilege for me to understand is that the right handed person may not understand, but it doesn't change the fact that to achieve the same thing, playing a guitar, the left handed people, the left handed person has to work differently. This is how I understand privilege. So you have to tell me whether you um, agree. And again, the person who commissions the guitar is right-handed. The person who um, sells the guitars is right-handed. The person who employs the people who make the guitars is right-handed. So to even be in a situation where a left-handed person is in the room to affect change um, that's a difficult situation. I should have asked this question before, and I think you know why I think the answer is. But again, back to the left-handed, right-handed example, we know that in positions of power, you're going to find more right-handed people than left-handed people, right? The system is created by right-handed people. So, this is a question I'm going to ask you, you don't have to answer. So, who has the moral imperative to affect change? Is it left-handed people or is it right-handed people? I'll just let that simmer. Fine. Uh, what do you see? And what are you thinking? So you are you are running, you're in the park, and you this lady is in front of you. Lady <coughs> Lady out for a room? Yeah, come on. Absolutely. What are you thinking? Exercise. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? Well, faster than men. Well, I don't want to be in the other. So, do you like her outfit? Do you like her outfit? Do you know what I think? Fair enough. Do you know what I think? Is she running away? No. No. That's what I'm thinking. I, what I am thinking if this happens to me is that I need to make sure that my steps are loud so that this lady knows that I am behind her. So that when I do run my step, I don't start them. Because all this shit has happened before. I have to make sure my steps are loud so she actually looks round as though this gentleman's behind me. I wouldn't hear your story if I'm like reading. <laughs> <laughs> but as a consequence of my experience, this is what I think. Um, so I had a friend who is from Lebanon, and we in the in Union we used to go to the gym a lot, and uh, we were walking home from the gym, and there was a lady who was walking in our direction, and she saw us. I looked like I did now, probably bigger. <laughs> Um, I wasn't wearing scrubs. He shorted at me, I was wide. We were um, just talking. But she clutched the bag and walked across the other, um, across the road. And my friend, who's very um, articulate, said, and little does she know that she's the safest she's ever been. And that really struck with me. So that's what I think, unless it's easy to like this. And again, back to the, the car analogy. 
So what MasterCard and the the central central locking comes on once you don't think about it. Ten times, a hundred times, then the common denominator has to be me. So um, let's take a breather. How are we doing? Yeah. Put your hands up if you are uncomfortable. Nobody here is uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm comfortable the first person to say I'm comfortable. <laughs> it's really important, thank you. No worries, no worries. So, does anybody have any questions or does anybody have any other experiences that you feel it might be useful in this environment for us to talk about? Has anybody had any experiences at work that are similar to the things that I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah um, being mistaken is you by yep. various members of staff at various levels. Spaces are what is that? Sorry? What did you say? Being mistaken as yeah. I or Ram. Um, oh. At the Royal, yeah. Maz and Emmanuel are uh, mm. yeah, all the time. It, it's yeah. offensive. Um, but again, it's, yeah. Anybody else? Um, when I was an SHO, there was a gentleman, my name is Olato I love all that to you. Uh, this gentleman was called Richard Ibitoye. And we, because you, you can see where I'm going. Um, Richard is also of Nigerian descent. And every now and then we'd get bleeped. And Richard would be like, but oh, you can fry up, right? <laughs> um, so he would just give them my bleed number. And it, but it's not, it's a, it's a, it was a quite a common thing. To the point that, so he's a neurology, are you probably consultant almost now? And when he became a neurologist, he gave me his stethoscope because like, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two stethoscopes, one that says my name and one that says his. And no one ever challenges. Um, right. Any other experiences that anybody has had or seen that you, know, you think might be relevant to the conversation that we're having? I've not seen personally, but on Twitter this weekend, there was a comment from, I don't know what grade she was, but she was like a junior medical black doctor in the States. Mm -hmm. And she was, said that she was in, I don't know if anyone else in ED, like manually stabilizing the patient's neck. The patient said something really offensive. Mm -hmm. And she, her boss, so the ED attending was there, and they, obviously didn't know how to respond as well and the person tweeting said that you know the situation at the time they said you know we won't tolerate any offensive language here mm -hmm. and she felt okay mm -hmm. at the time but it was afterwards like her boss sent her home everybody was kind of she felt pandering to her mm -hmm. and she said that you know we need to educate our colleagues as to how to respond appropriately and how to yeah but allyship is difficult right and it's a difficult topic and who who has the moral as you say imperative to educate themselves and who should be thinking of these things but in a work setting i think it, it would be really helpful for us to discuss it like this yeah. and to have something you know that we can pull out like an action plan or yeah. something like a lot in a &E mm. of people coming in who have refused to get even triaged by a nurse if they didn't want to look at them. Mm. Um, so you did get that a lot, but obviously you don't really know what to do apart from saying we don't tolerate that and we will not treat you and you must leave. You get treated by whoever you get treated by regardless. Mm. But it's not really something that's ever discussed or like mm. educated on. So like when this all started having you know, like big again in the news after George Floyd. Mm -hmm. I tried to like educate myself by buying all the books, everything, and reading them all. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, what more can I do apart from do nothing? Yeah. But it is hard because you don't talk about it. Absolutely. I think people are scared to talk absolutely. about it in case you feel like you look like a bad person You're absolutely right. for addressing it when actually it just needs to be talked about more openly. Whilst we're here, does anybody have any questions? So it's a difficult one. So when I speak to my black friends, they're like, I, one of the things that black people sometimes say in certain circumstances because of their, their experiences is that I'm not representative of all black people. 
I understand that. And I think it is, if you've ever been in a situation where you're asked to then represent everybody that is like you, you can, you can see the frustration. However, I would say that the difficulty we have is that because of um, where we're, we're all at socially, I probably have more black friends than you. So even if I wasn't that way inclined, I'm gonna be exposed to certain issues in a way that maybe you're not. And if I am the one of the few black people that you know, then who else are you supposed to ask? It's a, it's a difficult dynamic. And you're exactly right on that. So I think, and you know, now you, you, you've hit the, the, the nail on the head with regards to, you know, um, where, where I think we're gonna to get to at the end of this. I think from my point of view, the situation of, because I think the zero tolerance thing is, is relative if you ask me, because if it's another issue, we say zero tolerance, but we, we rarely have to say, okay, so you have to leave now, because it's coming with just you know, sepsis. So, you know, we feel like there's a, a moral imperative to treat them uh, and not take care of ourselves. However, I think that trust some trust guidelines would be good, but I, it, I have seen it handled well, and I've seen it handled badly. So in situations where it's handled well is the defense of the person who is the title of it. So actually this person is your doctor, this person is your nurse. If you are not willing to be seen by this person, you aren't gonna be seen by anybody else. However, I've also seen the opposite. Oh, you know, you just, you know, he's always, always like that, you know, we'll, we'll see him. And I think that the difficulty is that I imagine with the latter, somebody's thinking about, you know, let's just get things done, but you're not realizing how you're pandering to it. Pandering to it, you absolutely are, but. Well, letting it seem like it's okay behavior to do there, that. Um, there is that. Like but for, for, if I'm the person that's involved, I feel that you don't value me because of the fact that this is obviously targeted at me, but it's more important you, for you to get flow than it is to respect me as a human being. Um, and unfortunately, this happens a lot. Um, so, tr trust guidelines and stuff, absolutely. But I think from an individual point of view, and I will get to, to a bit more, I think we have to, um, do you understand the difference between um, allyship, anti-racist, and like, not saying anything? Do you understand the implications of those things? So somebody is being targeted for a reason, and we say nothing. And you're complicit. Are you supporting it? You're... Well, so that, as I understand it, is now the narrative that everybody seems to understand. Because it wasn't always as clear as that. You There's know, no such thing as an innocent bystander situation. It's very... Because it, 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 it's, it's such a difficult subject to talk about. And the fact that I'm up here doesn't mean that it's easy. I understand it's not easy for you, please understand it's not easy for me. Um, however, the fact that on one side people may be concerned about, I don't want to say the wrong thing, purely intention, I don't want to say the wrong thing, therefore they say nothing. And on the other side, again, black people are not a monolith, but some of us are tired of having this conversation. You know, some of us are, um, angry at the fact that we're still having this conversation. Some of my friends are um, doing our best to keep the fight alive. Because the thing is, like you're saying about when it's coming to news again, that's very telling because these issues never went away. It's just they went away from the news cycle. So whereas it might not be your everyday, it is my everyday. You know, um, and the fact that I'm not talking about all the, talking about it all the time doesn't mean that it's not a big issue. If that makes sense. Um, so in terms of, I, I, I want to talk about dealing with it later. So are we happy? Any questions? Can I just put one out to the group? I've not experienced racism in any of these forms apart from in the fact where sometimes in a consultation it's all going well, and someone will say, "I'm glad you're one of these nice English doctors." Really? And I'm. I've responded in different ways and I have never found a way that is satisfactory both shutting down that avenue without also completely losing 
they yeah. report the clinical report the patient and I wonder, wondered what anyone else does if they have that kind of conversation. Thank you for bringing that up, sir. What's the appropriate thing to do? Ask them what they mean. Yeah, and, I, and that's what I've done before. Mm. And, yeah. And then what do they say? They say, you know what? I want to be like too much. Yeah. And you know that yeah. I, when, it, when it gets down to it, I don't I've not ever pushed them to that point mm. where I'm like having an argument with them about it. I've always at that point just like said nothing and moved on. And that's not the right thing to do. I know that's not the right thing to do. But it's I'm, a fear of being uncomfortable though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, like, you know, to, really like you say as well, you're also trying to preserve the clinical relationship here, which I can't understand is also challenging. I also think it's hard when it's like, you know, people our age and hopefully like our parents' age, I feel like should know better. But there isn't there is like a I don't know what age it is, I don't have like an average number, but there is like an echelon of elderly people who are racist and like, it's okay to be. and they think it's okay to be, and I wouldn't even know how to begin to, as a 90 year old lady who's come in for whatever reason, who says to me like, it happened recently, she said, oh, I saw my GP, the situation didn't get where it was. He was one of those foreign doctors, mm. and she just carried on and carried on. And I'm like, do I fight this now? And if I do, yeah. how do I fight it? Yeah, what, how, what, where, where am I going with this yeah. fight? Things that myself and other people have been told, you speak English very well. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that before, yeah. from sense of like, you know, have times where at the end of a consultation, we're doing it, they'll be like, Oh, you're very articulate. It's like the question, Where are you actually from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Yeah. The, the the idea that I could be from here is a ridiculous yeah. 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 I mean, I'm born in Nigeria, so for me, it's a, it's a question for people who are born here. Where are you from is a question that annoys me so much. Yeah. And I will always just say Manchester. Like, oh, you mean, oh, from my mum? That's one thing that really annoys me. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult mm. thing. And I think, so, Seb, so you've touched on something that, let's say, you, um, it gives you an inkling as to, like, from a response point of view, things that um, black and ethnic minority doctors have to deal with. Because, again, say how many times that I am aware that this is an issue, do I say something? It should be every time. But I know that, like, yeah, so like I said, like the nice old lady who plus minus confusion, like, then, how well is this going to go? But it's the thing. So, for me, when it's to me about me, mm -hmm. so every day, that's what, you know. There are days when I actually don't want it to be about today, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think I don't know that there is a right answer, mm -hmm. but I think we're on the right lines in terms of at least we're thinking about it. I think I would definitely say that, yeah. So having lived this life, I think you have to pick your battles. We are we are having this conversation every day because it would be tiresome. But I do think there are times when actually you have to say because of the fact that the people that they're referring to are your colleagues. Um, and again, the thing about priorities, it only matters when you have to make a choice. So I am aware of the fact that my family is more important than you guys. So if my wife called me now, I would just leave because 
Because that mm -hmm. she, she comes first. So from a, and I understand it's a bit of a tricky situation when it comes to paintings and stuff like that, but we have to take care of ourselves. Ourselves means our whole self, our own physical, mental health, and our colleagues. Allowing somebody to be disparaging about somebody who is supposed to be esteemed by your school, you have to ask yourself a few questions about what that means. Um, I'm sorry guys, we're going to chat with you on that, take a breather slide. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've talked about so far is kind of like soft things. But, to flip it, there are some hard outcomes that are impacted by biases and things like that. So, um, again, this was a five minute Google search. This isn't like a, um, a 30,000 word dissertation um, in terms of finding out this information. So, um, perinatal, neonatal, postnatal deaths, maternal deaths, I don't know whether you knew, but black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth. And they never look at it. There's a doctor on, she's on Instagram, so I don't know if anyone's on Instagram, called Diana Geek, and yep. her and her husband are both dying in mm -hmm. and she does loads of stuff on this about how no one looks into like the yeah. deaths as much as they do for white people yeah. and their death rates are so much higher. So there was a study in America that showed if black women are looked after by black uh, nurses and doctors, that difference in um, mortality kind of not totally disappear yeah. but get back to no way. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So again, because the difficulty is that lots has to be looked into into the data to figure out actually what the pieces are. However, so and, and there's lots of evidence that you know there are some conditions that black and ethnic minority people um, are more susceptible to than our um, white counterparts. However, some of this is going to be due to not the patient. Some of this is going to be due to their interactions with us, healthcare. Uh, um, ischemic heart disease, stroke, sepsis, um, post-surgical deaths, and obviously we're aware of all the issues from a COVID point of view. So, um, you can see, again as a black man, as a black doctor, a, a colleague of mine wrote a piece talking about, you know when we were packing for the NHS? And basically the crux of it was, I wonder whether these people that are clapping are clapping for me. Because the experiences in my life make me question whether they view me in the same way as I might view my white counterparts. Um, so compulsory treatment orders and sections, there is, there is a hugely disproportionate representation of black people in these situations. Um, did you know, so when you look at the people who refer to the GMC by race, when you come from the population, it's the same, it's, it's equivalent to population. When it comes from your colleagues, so referrals to the GMC from doctors, black and ethnic minority people are disproportionately represented. I thought that was across the board, not... No, well, so this, this was a couple of years ago, so I don't know what it is now. Um, so, again, I'm a consultant. So what do you mean? Do you mean your colleagues saying that you've done something yeah. wrong? Yeah, at a higher rate. Than more than we're going to say it's wrong because you're black. And well, so the data is that there's more referrals of black people than there are of white people. Right, okay. So I'm a consultant. I believe that I've done the work to be able to work at this level. But not only do I have to work at making sure I make the right diagnosis, I have to make sure that the impression that I give off is not such that lends me so that my colleagues refer me to the MC. That's my every day. And it's one of those situations, so like, I mean, it's a wider conversation about black and white because these things are social constructs, they're not real things. Um, however, I don't ever, or at least I very rarely, forget that I'm black because of the way that society reminds me about that. I wonder those of you who aren't black go through life being reminded you're white or you're, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, let's talk about stop and search. And f for all of us who are talking, who are, because again, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting dynamic we have in this country. That's, that's a US problem. It's not a US problem. Yeah. It's not a US problem. I think people just think that the US is more racist. Yeah. 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 It's nice to think someone else is worse off. Exactly. I think that's probably where it stems from, but it's definitely not the US problem. For me. It's because our media is run by privileged white males. Potentially. Potentially. I've, I've an example of that. One of my good friends at uni was from Nigeria as well, and we were sitting in the pub, just me and him, and the pub was raided. Um, for I think they were looking for drugs essentially. The landlord was crying, didn't find anything. And the policeman spotted my friend, walked up to the two of us and accosted him. Um, like I've seen bouncers do to drunk people on the street, mm -hmm. but he was completely sober. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I said to the policeman, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. It was, you yeah. know. And I, he walked away and I was horrified. Yeah. And my friend just went, ah. yeah. but he was like, ah, oh, that's. It's not the first time that's happened, of course. Um, so again, I want you to imagine what it's like to have that mindset, be aware of these issues, have these things happen to yourself, have these things happen to your friends, and um, just come to work. <laughs> you know, I, again, I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for anybody, I'm just wanting you to paint a picture of what's actually happening. I remember walking home from, no, not the house with the caravan, the next house. Um, and I was holding a loaf of bread, which maybe in some countries is a weapon of destruction. Loaf or baton. No. Yeah. Um, and I was stopped by the police. And I was, they were like, what are you doing? Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm walking, I'm going home. Um, where have you been? <laughs> to the shop. Um, and again, I had people I didn't know just like, you're right, just because it, it, it's just a ridiculous situation. What do you hope to get by stopping me? I'm, again, I'm pretty sure I know why you stopped me. And again, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's police, increased police presence. That's fine. But again, from a privileged point of view, when, when I see police, I don't necessarily feel safe. Whereas I don't know necessarily that some people who don't look like me feel the same. So, what was the point of all this? Um, really, I wanted to. I'm, I'm, you're all, you know, intelligent people. You're in the highest fifth, uh, you know, in, in terms of the population because of the job that you do. Um, I wanted us to see whether we can work out some empathy. I'm sure you're all empathetic as well, but let's look at some more, because it is my experience that until you're able to put yourself in the position of the person in the oppressed seat, it's difficult to know, or to even have the desire to do anything. Um, have you seen a time to kill? Time to kill, good film. Um, so um, I think it's a, I think it's a true story. So Samuel L. Jackson's was in the deep South America. Samuel L. Jackson's character is a father whose young daughter is um, accosted, raped, and killed uh, by people. I think they were in a Ku Klux Klan family. Um, and Matthew McConaughey's character is his lawyer. They're not friends because sometimes that's um, by the by, but that's, they're not friends. And it's getting to the end of the um, film, and it's about to make it an argument. And Matthew McConaughey's character is pontificating about all that, and he's going to convince him. You can imagine how the stakes are set. We're in the South. Samuel Jackson is black. The, I think the the um, jury were all white, so you can imagine how we expect this to go. Um, and the fact that we can even expect it to go anyway speaks to all the things that have been happening. And Samuel L. Jackson's character says to him, "Well, what did it take for you?" because evidently there were other lawyers who didn't take the case. So, Matthew McConaughey's character, David's closing statement, he's a very impassioned to think about all the think about this young girl who is just full of life and bubbly, and then she gets attacked and all this horrible stuff happens to her and she gets dangled like a rag doll on the street and she 
you know, um, and then his last words were, imagine she's white. You know, that's what it took for him to get to the point of compassion. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about other things, about colour blindness and that kind of stuff. I personally think that colour blindness argument is a bit of a nonsense, because what do you do at traffic lights? Um, the, the, I understand it's a well-meaning thing that people want to say, I don't see colour, I just think it's dumb, uh, because we all see colour, um, and we should just embrace the difference rather than shy away from it. It's what it is, I'm black, or some of you are not. But, we talked about being uncomfortable. I believe that truly great things happen when we're able to push through the discomfort. Anything that was achieved in any sphere of life, at any point, somebody had to be uncomfortable. And I believe it's possible for us to create a work environment, at the very least, where these things are less well tolerated, and at least conversations are had so that insight is gained, so that we can have empathy, human to human. So there's also a degree to which we live in a, in a digital world, so there are some people that I know, and I happen to hold this opinion, that I'm not sure there's any excuse for ignorance. Given that you can read a book today, or you can spend half a day looking at resources online, and you can have more information today than somebody who was considered an expert a generation ago. Did you see about the Sainsbury's like that? I've heard about that, yeah. I mean, we could keep recounting the examples of bias and prejudice and stuff like that. Um, but from my point of view, I think, so again, back to the ignorance thing, because the information is so readily available, when people don't know, it makes me ask the question, is this ignorance willful? Because it's much more comfortable not to put your head, your, your head above the parapet and think about it. Um, I wanted to start a conversation. So, um, what can we do? So again, somebody is being paid lots of money to deal with this from a legislative level. But I'll be honest with you, you can't legislate for compassion. You can't legislate for human decency. You can't legislate for love. And I believe that it is a responsibility of each person to look inside themselves and say, well, is any of this true of me? Are you the kind of person who got more annoyed at the looters than you did about George Floyd's dying? Were you more vocal about that than that? Um, are you the, um, you know, when somebody um, is killed or um, there's a, um, a situation that happened where a black person is put in a negative light or, or it dies at brutal brutality, are you more concerned about what they did than the fact that they probably shouldn't have been killed on the street because the police aren't supposed to be um, jury, um, judge, jury, and executioner. So how much of that is true for me? And that's everybody. Because of, is it Harvard that is doing this thing like implicit bias online? And black people sometimes call the same way, so it's not, we're not exempt from it. And that's a big conversation. Um, things that I'm going to suggest. Um, Google Jade Elliott. I'm not going to write her name down. She's a lady who was a, uh, she started up as a um, high school teacher in the south of America. I'm going to leave that there. Feel good in there. Inform yourself. Is there really any excuse nowadays to not know more than we know? Um, I would advise that you read Natives by Carla. It's a very, 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 very interesting and informative um, book. And it puts a lot of the conversation that we're having in context, but specifically for the UK, because a lot of the information you get is from a US point of view. And push through the discomfort. So those of you who've been on war rounds of me, where it's relevant, I talk about the fact that I'm black, but it's not always relevant. <laughs> 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 but, you know, um, if there are any conversations that you want to have, I'm happy for the, to be the person that you discuss it with. I should have put on there, Google, Emmanuel Actual, who was an American football star, and he started a YouTube series called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. So some of the things that you might have thought, oh, can we ever talk about this? Can I ever say that? Maybe somebody's asked it already. 
Um, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. I do have references. But, um, <laughs> And again, a lot of this stuff took me five minutes to find online. So thank you very much for listening. Before you go, does anybody want to say anything? You don't have to. That comes. Well, I'm shutting down. <laughs>